day 14, February 14, Valentine's Day. I'm not going to focus on Valentine's Day. I'm focusing today on Dorothy West as I celebrate and read the great black masters. Dorothy is a writer remembered for her sharp observations of varied issues within the African-American community. She will always be remembered for the sharp observations of economic, social, class, and racial gender issues within the African community. And I'm reading this from her, from uh, the biography.com page. Uh, she, uh, she, she completed her first novel, which I'll be reading portions of today, the chapters one, two, three, in 1948. She also started two literary magazines, one with Richard Wright, and we just finished doing two uh, excerpts from Richard Wright last week, um, Native Boy and Black, uh, Native Son and Black Boy. Uh, she was born in Boston in 1907 on June the 2nd. She was the daughter of a freed slave. Uh, she had a fairly affluent upbringing. She studied with tutors. She attended ex an exclusive high school. She started writing stories as a child and earned recognition for her work as a teenager. Her story promised in fulfillment won a contest and was published in a local newspaper. Another story earned her a trip to New York City in 1926. It tied for second place with a work by Zora Neale Hurston in an Opportunity Magazine contest. West decided to stay in New York and became affiliated with the burgeoning art scene in, city, in the city's Harlem neighborhood, which later became known as the Harlem Renaissance. She befriended poet Langston Hughes and other members of this artistic and literary movement. And just a little bit about uh, her novel. Uh, uh, Dorothy found um, Dorothy West found um, her found work as a member of the WPA administration's Federal Writers Project in the late 1930s. While at the WPA, she wrote numerous stories. The project ended in the 40s. Dorothy made some changes in her life. She she her family had a summer home on the island of Mount Billions Vineyards in. Massachusetts, which she often visited, and in 1947, Dorothy completed her first novel, Life is Easy, which I will be reading from today. She, she <clears throat> wake up, hissed Cleo somewhat fiercely. Judy was five and her legs were fat, but she got up steam and pro propelled her small style body along like a tired cr crow straining in the, in, the, in the wake of a racing sloop. She, she, she peeped at her mother from under the expensive brim of her leg on straw. She knew what Cleo would look like. Cleo looked mad. Cleo swished down the spit spattered street with her head in the air and her sailor slant her pompadour. Her French heels wrapped the sidewalk smartly, and her starched skirt swayed briskly from her slender buttocks. Though the thin stuff of her waist shirt, her golden shoulders gleamed, and they were tied to the rest of her torso with the immaculate strap of her camisole commence and summer shirt, which were banded together with a tiny gold-plated safety pins. One gloved hand gave ballast to Judy. The other gripped her pocketbook. This large patent leather pouch her, her, held her secret life with her sisters. In it were letters of obligation, acknowledging her latest distribution of money and clothing and uh, prodigal advice. The instruments of the concrete side of her charity, which instruments never left in violet privacy of her purse, which were her credit books showing various aliases and unfinished payments, and her pawn shop tickets, the expiration dates of which had mostly come and gone, constraining her to tell her husband with no intent or honesty that another of her diamonds had gone down the drain. The lesser items in Cleo's pocketbook were a bit of commissal, lightly sprinkled with talcum powder 
and only to be used in extreme necessity if there were no eye to observe this public immodesty, a lollipop for Judy in case she got tiresome, an Irish linen handkerchief for elegance, a cotton square if Judy got stuck up her mouth, and a change perch with silver, half of which Cleo clandestinely and without conscience had shaken out at Judy's pig bank. Snug in the bill compartment of the bag at $45, which she had come by more or less legitimately after a minor skirmish with her husband on the matter of renting a ten-room house. She had begun her attack in the basement kitchen of her landlady's house, a brownstone dwelling in the south end of Boston. Judy had been sent upstairs to play until bedtime, and Bart had been basking in the afterglow of a good dinner. Ten years before, he had brought his bride to this address where they had three furnished rooms in the use of the kitchen and the clothesline at a rent which was which had never increased from his first modest figure. Here, where someone else was responsible for the upkeep, Bart intended to stay and save his money until he was rich enough to spend it. Cleo had bided her time impatiently. Now Judy was nearing school age. She had no intention of skinning, sending, her school, sending her to a school in the South End. Whenever she passed these schools at recess time, recess time, she would hustle Judy out of sight and sound. Little naughty head niggas, she would muddily unkindly while Judy looked shocked because nigger was a bad word. These midget comedians made Cleo feel that she was back in the deep South. Their accent prickled there, her scalp. Their rancious laughter scoured, soured the sweet New England air. Their games were reminiscent of all the whooping and hollering she had indulged in before her emancipation. These rare and tearing young ones had brought the folkways of the South to the classrooms of the North. Their numerical strength gave them the brass to mock their timid teachers and resist attempts to make them conform to the Massachusetts pattern. Those among them who were born in Boston fell into the customs of their southern bred kin before they were old enough to know that a Bostonian, black or white, should consider himself a special species of fish. The nicer colored people proceeded by a similar class of whites were moving out of the South End, so prophetically named with this influx of black cotton belters. For, for years, these Northern Negroes had lived next door to white neighbors and had taken pride in proximity. They viewed their Southern brothers with alarm and scattered all over the city and its suburbs to escape this plague of their own locusts. Miss Althea Beanie, Judy's private teacher who for the past three years have been coming four, four mornings weekly to give Judy the benefit of her accent and genteel breeding and to get a substantial lunch that was served as her principal meal of the day had told Cleo of a house for rent to colored on a street abutting the Riverway Boulevard which touched the stoic fins and the arteries of the sacred Brookline. On the previous night, the his brother Simeon the impoverished owner and editor of Negro Weekly, the Clarion, had received a telephone call from Mr. Van Riper, who sincerely advised him that he would let his ten-room house for thirty-five, let his ten-room house for thirty-five dollars monthly to a respectable colored family. Notice to this effect was to be inserted in the proper column of the paper. Theater, the the Clarion's chronicler of social events, had urged Simeon to hold the notice until Cleo had the first chance to see the house. Cleo had been so grateful that she had promised Thea an extravagant present, though Thea could could better have used her overdue pay that Cleo had spent in an irresistible moment in a department store. The prospect of Judy entering school in Brookline filled her with awe. There she would rub shoulders with children whose parents took pride in sending them to public school to learn how a democracy functions. This moral obligation discharged, they were then sent to a private school to fulfill their social obligations to themselves. It's like having a house drop in our laps, said Cleo dramatically. We'd be fools, Mr. Judson, to let this opportunity pass. What in the name of common sense, Bart demanded, do we want with a ten-room house.
We'd rattle around like three pills in a box, paying good money for unused space. What what this Jack the Ripper want for, for, for rent, $50? Cleo said easily because the sum was believable and she saw a chance to pocket something for herself. That's highway robbery, said Bart in an aggrieved voice. It hurt him to think that Cleo would want him to pay that extravagant rent month after month and year after year until they all landed in the poorhouse. Hold on to your hats, Cleo said coolly. I never knew a man who got so hurt in his pocketbook. Don't think I want the care of a three-story house. I wasn't born to work myself to the bone. It's Judy I'm thinking of. I don't want her to start school with hoodlums. Where the common sense, what's, where's the common sense in paying good money to Thea if you want your daughter to forget everything she's learned? Bart had never seen the sense in paying Thea Benny to teach his daughter to be a Bostonian when two expensive doctors of Cleo's uncompromising choosing could bear witness to a tranquil Boston birth. But he did not want Cleo to think that he was less concerned with his child's upbringing than she. Slowly, an idea took shape. I tell you how I figure we can swing this rent without strain. We can live on one floor and let the others and let the other two. If we got fifteen dollars a floor, our part would be plain sailing. Uh huh, said Cleo gravely. He studied her pleasant expression with suspicion. It wasn't like her consent to anything with to, to her for her to consent with anything without an argument. You better say what you want to say now, he advised her. Why, I like a house full of people, she said dreamily. I've missed it ever since I left the South. Mama and Pa and my three sisters made a good-sized family. As long as I'm the boss of the house, I don't care how many people are in it. Well, of course, he said cautiously. Strangers won't won't be like your own flesh. Matter of fact, you, you don't want to get too friendly with tenants. It encourages them to fall behind with the rent. I tell you what, she said brilliantly. We can rent furnished rooms instead of flats. There, there won't be any headaches with poor payers. It's easier to ask a room in a package bag and go than it is to tell a family to pack their furniture. He saw the logic of that and nodded sagely. Ten to one of rumors out all day at work. You, you don't see too much of them. But when you let flats to families, there's bound to be children. No matter how they fell behind, I couldn't put people with children on the sidewalk. I, it just wouldn't sit right on my conscience. Cleo said quietly, I have banked my life on your saying that. For a moment's tenderness flooded her, but the emotion, but the emotion embarrassed her. She said briskly, you remind me of Pa. One of us had a sore tooth. Mama would tell us to go to sleep and forget it, but Pa would nurse us half the night, keeping us awake with kindness. He accepted the dubious compliment with a modest smile. Then his smile froze with a grimace of pain. He had been hurt in his pocketbook. I'll take every pretty penny to furnish all those extra bedrooms. We don't want to bite off more than we can chew. Don't know what unfurnished flats would be better. We don't know what unfurnished flats would be better after all. We could pick settled people without any children to make them chicken hearted. She stared, she stared at him like an animal at bay. Little specks of green began to glow in her gray eyes and her lips pulled away from her even teeth. Bart started back, started back in bewilderment. You call yourself a businessman, she said passively, passionately. You run a big store. You're taking a lot of money. But whenever I corner you for a dime, it's like pulling teeth to get it out of you. You always have the same excuse. You need every dollar to buy bananas. And when I say, what's the sense of being in business? If you can't enjoy the cash, you always say, in business, you have to spend money to make money. Now, when I try to advise you to buy a few measly sticks of bedroom furniture, a man who spends thousands of dollars on fruits, you balk me like a mule at a racetrack. You rub this mustache with his four fingers. I see what you mean, he conceded. I try to keep my store filled with fruit. I can't bear to see an empty storeroom. I guess you got a right to feel the same way about a house. In the long run, it's better to be able to call every stick of you, stick your own than to have half your rooms depended on some outsider's furniture. She expelled a long breath. That's settled then. 
He thought it prudent to warn her we'll have to economize to the bone while we're furnishing that house. She she rolled her eyes upwards. Well, we'll eat bones if you say so. He answered quietly, you and the child will never eat less than the best as long as I live. And all my planning is to see to it that you'll never know what want when I'm gone. No one on earth will ever say that I wasn't a good provider. That's my pride, Cleo. Don't hurt it when you don't have to. Well, I guess you're not the worst husband in the world, she acknowledged softly and added slowly, and I guess I'm the kind of wife God made me. And she did not echo, and she did not like the echo of that in her ears. She, she said quickly, and you can like it or lump it. Bart took out an impressive roll of bills, peeled off a few of the lesser ones and laid them on the table. The sight of the bankroll made Cleo sick with envy. There were so many things she could do with it. All Mr. Judson would do with it was to buy more bananas. She sighed and counted her modest pile. There were only $45. It's $5 short, she said rigidly. Yep, he said complacently. I figure if Jack the Ripper wants $50, he'll take 45 if he knows he gets he gets it every gets it every month on the dot. And if and if he ever goes up five dollars on rent, we still won't be paying any more than when he asked for in the first place. In business, Cleo, I've learned to stay on my toes. You got to get up you got to get up with the early birds to get ahead of me. Chapter two Her eyes flew open. The birds were waking in the Carolina woods. Cleo always got up with them. There were never enough hours in a summer day to extract the full joy of being alive. She tumbled out of the big old-fashioned bed. Small Serena stirred and laid still on her share of the pillow. At the foot of the bed, Lily and Charity nestled together. She stared at her three younger sisters, seeing the defenselessness of their innocent sleep. The bubbling mischief in, in her made her take one of Lily's long braid and double knot it with one of Charity's. She looked back at Serena, who tried so hard to be a big girl and never let anyone help her dress. She picked up Serena's little drawers and turned one leg inside out. She was almost sorry she could be so she could be far away when the fun began. She could picture Lily and Charity leaping to the floor from opposite sides of the bed and their heads snapping back and banging together. As for Serena, surprise would be spread all over her solemn face when she stepped into one leg of her drawers and found out the other leg close to her. She would start her she would start all over again trying to get her other foot in this time only to find out she had stepped into the same kettle of hot water. She would wrestle for fifteen minutes getting mad and madder. Cleo had to clap her hands to her mouth to hush her giggles. She would get a whipping for it. Mama would never see the joke. Mama would say it was mean it would, would say it would be mean to tease your sisters. You had to walk a chalk line to praise her. Sometimes Cleo tried to walk a chalk line, but after a while, keeping to the straight and narrow made her too nervous. At home, there was nothing to do except stay around. Away from home, there were trees to climb and boys to fight and hell to raise with Josie Beauchamp. She climbed out of the open window and dropped to the ground at the moment that Josie Beauchamp was quietly creeping down the stairs of her magnificent house. Someday Cleo was going to live in a fine house, too, and maybe someday Josie was going to be as poor as a church mouse. They, they met by the tree at the foot of, of which they had buried their symbols of friendship. Josie had buried a gold ring because she loved it the best of everything, and Cleo best of everybody. Cleo had buried Lily's doll mostly because it tickled her to tell her timid sister that she had seen a big rat dragging it under the house. Lily had taken a long stick and poked around. By the time it touched something, Lily had jumped a mile. Cleo and <clears throat> Cleo and Josie wandered over the Bochamp place, their bare feet drinking in the dew, their faces splashed to fill the morning. Only the birds were abroad, their vivid splashes of color, the brilliant outpouring of their waking songs filling the eye and the ear with the summer's intoxication. They did not talk. They, they had no words to express their aliveness. They wanted none. Their bodies were their eloquence. Clapsing hands, they began to skip, too impatient of meeting the morning to walk towards it and any walk towards it any longer. Suddenly Cleo pulled her hand away and tapped Josie on the shoulder. 
They should have chosen who was to be it, but Cleo had no time for counting out. The wildness was in her, the unrestrained joy, the desire to run to the edge of the world and fling her arms around the sun and rise with it through time and space to the center of everywhere. She was swift as a deer as Mercury, with Josie running after her, falling back and back until Josie broke the magic of the morning with her exhausted cry. Cleo, I can't catch you. Nobody can catch me, Cleo exalted. But she spun around to wait for Josie. The little sob in Josie's throat touched the tenderness she always felt towards those who would let her show herself the stronger. They wandered back towards Josie's house. For now, the busyness of the birds had quieted to, to let the human toilers take over the morning. Muted against the white folks sleeping, the Negro voices made velvet sounds. The field hands and the house servants diverged towards their separate spheres. The house servants settling their mask in place. The field hands waiting for the overseer's eye before they stopped, stooped to civility. Cleo and Josie dwaddled before the stables. The riding horses whinnied softly, thrusting their noses to the day. Josie's pony, pony nuzzled her hand, wanting to hear his name dripping and honey, and Cleo moved away. Anybody could ride an old pony. She wanted to ride General Beauchamp's roan red stallion, who shot at any touch but his masters. She marched back to Josie. Damn me to ride the red horse, she challenged. Her eyes were green as they bored into Josie, the gray gone under her inner passion. No, said Josie, desperately trying not to flounder in the green sea. He'd throw you and trample you. He'd kill you dead. He can't trump me. I ain't scared of nothing. I dare you. I dare you. I double dare you. I won't. I won't. I'm bad, but I'm not wicked. I'm not wicked neither, and I just ain't no, ain't a coward. She streaked to the star and flung open the barrier. The wild horse smelled her wildness. Her green eyes locked with his red fleck glare. Their wheels met, clashed, and would not yield. The roan made a savage sound in his throat. His nozzles flared. His great sides rippled. He lowered his head to lunge, but Cleo was quicker than he was. She grasped his mane, leaped on his broad neck, slid down his back, and dug her heels in his flank. Giddy up, red horse, she cried. He flung back his head red and crashed out of the stall with Josie screeching and sobbing and sidestepping just in time. Cleo hung on for ten minutes, ten minutes of dazzling flight to the sun. She felt no fear, feeling only the power beneath her and the power inside her and the rush of the wind on which she and the roan were riding. When she was finally thrown, she landed unhurt in a clover field. It never occurred to her to feel for broken bones. She never doubted that she had a charmed life. Her sole mishap was a minor one. She had split the seats of her drawers. She got up, brushed off her pinafore, and in a fever now to get home and brag to her sisters, she knew that she ought to let Josie see that she was still alive. The riderless horse would return, and Josie would never tell who had ridden him off, but she would be tormented by the fear as long as Cleo stayed away. Josie did not want to eat, no matter what fancy things the white folks had for breakfast. She would not want to ride in her pony cart, no matter how pretty a picture she made. She did not want to go calling with her stylish mother, not even if she was let to wear the dress that came all the way from Paris. On this bright day, the sun had darkened for Josie, and nobody but Cleo could make it shine again. The four sisters sat around the kitchen table, eating their salt pork and biscuit and hominy, ship slipping, shipping down their buttermilk. Charity was nine, two years old, younger than Cleo. Lily was eight, Serena was four. Their faces were tear-streaked. Cleo's was not, though she was the one who had, who had got the whipping. Mama couldn't keep track of the track track of the times she had tanned Cleo's hide, trying to bring her up as a Christian. But the devil was trying just as hard in the other direction. There Cleo was this morning, looking square in Mama's eyes, telling her she must have been sleepwalking again. Couldn't remember getting dressed or tying her sister's braids together. Just remembered coming awake in a clover field. Mama had tried to beat the truth out of her, but Cleo wouldn't budge from a lie. Worst of all, she wouldn't cry and show remorse. Finally, Mama had to put away the strap because her other children looked as if they would die if she didn't. 
They couldn't bear to see Cleo beaten. She was their oldest sister, their protector. She wasn't up, she, she wasn't afraid of the biggest boy or the fiercest dog or the meanest teacher. She was sass. She could sass back. She could do anything. They accepted her teasing and tormenting as they accepted the terrors of the night. Night was all night was always followed by day and made day seem more wonderful. Mother stood by the hearth feeling helpless in her mind. Cleo was getting too big to be, but she wasn't a child that would listen to reason. Whatever she didn't want to hear went in one ear and out the other. She was old enough to be setting an example for her sisters, and all they saw of her do was devilment. With, lo with a long blackened fire stick, Mama carefully tilted the lid of the three-legged skillet to see if the cornbread was done. The rest of Pa's noon dinner, the greens and rice, the hunk of fresh pork was waiting in his bucket. Gently, she let the lid drop and began to work the skillet out of it out of its covering of coals that had been charred down from the oak wood. As the skillet moved forward, the top coals dislodged, their little plunking sounds was much like the tears plopping in Mama's heart. Sulkily, Cleo spooned the harmony she hated because she mustn't make Mommy madder by leaving it. Mama bleached her corn and lye water made from fireplace ashes. Pa spit tobacco juices in those ashes. He spit to the side, and Mama took her ashes from the center, but that didn't make it seem any cleaner. Mama thought everything about Pa was wonderful, even his spit. Cleo made a face at Mama's back, and then her face had to smile a little bit when she reached the dimples going in and out of Mama's round arms. She could almost touch their softness with her with your eyes. A, la a flush lay just under the surface, giving them a look of tender warmth. For all the loving in Mama's arms, she had no time for it all day. Only at night, when her work was done and her children were in bed, she knew by Mama's silver laughter that she was finding time for Pa. Mama loved Pa better than anyone, and, and, and what was left over from the loving him was divided among her daughters. Divided even, Mama said, whenever Cleo asked, asked her, never once would Mama say she loved one child the most. On their straggling way home to the mill with Pa's dinner, Cleo told her sisters about her wild ride. They were bewitched by her fanciful telling. Timid Lily forgot to watch where she was walking. Her toes uncurled. She snatched up a stick and got astride it. Serena clung to Charity's hand to keep from flying. Cleo was carrying her away, and she wanted to feel the ground again. She wanted to take, take Pa's dinner and go home and play house. Charity saw a shining prince on a snow-white charger. The prince rode towards her, dazzling her eyes with light coming nearer and nearer, leaning to swoop her up in his arms. And Cleo, looking at Charity's parted lips and glowing eyes, thought that Charity was seeing her red, riding the red horse into the sun, a triumphant tale in which she did not fall, but gra grandly dismounted to General Bachamp's applause came to its thrilling conclusion. She turned and looked at, looked at Lily scornfully because... The stick was not a horse. Lily felt foolish and let the stick fall and stepped squish on that fat old worm. Serena freed her hand, released from Cleo's spell. She felt independent again. Charity's smiling prince vanished and there was only Cleo walking ahead as usual, forgetting to take back the bucket she had passed to Charity. Pa was waiting in the shade, letting the toil pour off him in perspiration. His tired face lightened with love when, when, when they reached him. He opened his dinner bucket and gave them each a taste. Nothing ever melted so good in their mouths as a bite of Pa's victuals. He gave them each a copper, too, though he could hardly spare it. What with four to feed and Mama wanting yard goods and buttons and ribbons to keep herself feeling proud of the way she kept her children. Time was he gave them kisses for toting his bucket. But the day Cleo brazenly said, I don't want a kiss, I want a copper, the rest of them shamefully said it after her. Most times, Dad, Pa had to struggle to dig down so deep. Four coppers a day, six days a week, was a half a day's pay going up in smoke for candy. Pa couldn't bring himself to tell Mama. She would have wrung out them that Cleo had been the one who started it, and Cleo was his eldest. A man who loved his wife couldn't help loving his firstborn best, the child of his fiercest passion. 
when that firstborn was a girl, she could trample on his heart and he would swear on a stack of Bibles that it didn't hurt. The sisters put their coppers in their pinafore pockets and skipped back through the woods. Midway, Cleo stopped and pointed to a towering oak. You all want to bet me a copper I can't swing by my feet from the top of that tree? L Lily clapped her hands to her eyes. I, I doesn't want to bet you, she implored. I ain't fixing to see you fall. Serena said severely, you bust your neck. You see if mama don't bust it again. Clarity, Clarity said tremulously, Cleo, would you uh, do it if if our sisters was if our sisters was was dead? Cleo saw her sister dressed up as fine. Josie Beauchamp stretched out in a coffin with her sister sobbing behind it, and Paul with his Sunday handkerchief holding his tears, and Mama crying, "I loved your best, Cleo." I never said it when you were alive, and I'm sorry, sorry. I waited to say it after you were gone. You hold my copper, Charity, and if I die, you can have it. Lily opened two of her fingers and peeked through the crack. Cleo, I'll give you mine if you don't make me see see you hanging upside down. It's one thing to hear Cleo tell about herself. It's another thing to see her fixing to kill herself. Me too, said Serena, with a little sob more for the top copper than for Cleo, whom she briefly hated for compelling unnecessary sacrifice. You can have mine, said Charity. Harshly, her sweet tooth ached for a peppermint stick, and she almost wished that Cleo was dead. Cleo flashed them all an exuberant smile. She had won their money without trying. She had been willing to risk her neck to buy rich Josie Beauchamp some penny candy. Now it was too late to achieve Josie Beauchamp's lost hours of anxiety. Cleo wanted to carry her a bag of candy so that when Josie got through with being glad and got mad, she wouldn't stay mad too long. She held out her hand, each tight fist poised over her palm, desperately clinging aloft, then slowly opened the release bright, bright coin that was to have added a special sweetness to the summer day. Cleo couldn't bear to see the woe-begone faces. She felt frightened, trapped by their wounded eyes. She had, something, she had to do something to change their expressions. I'll do a stunt for you. She said feverishly, I'll swing by my hands. It ain't nothing to be scared of, you see? You watch. Quickly and agilely, she climbed the tree and hung by her hands. Wildly, wildly, she slung the, swung to make them forget she had taken their money to let them see how wonderful she was. Then a boy came by, just an ordinary knotted head, knobby kneed boyish. He looked at her and laughed because to him, a girl carrying on so crazy, Cut a funny figure. She wanted to kill him. He made her feel silly. She climbed down. She knew he was watching her, watching the split in her drawers. Then he then when she reached the ground, he whirled to face. She whirled to face him and found his feet wavering in front of her. He was walking on his hands, and her sisters were squealing in delight. They had seen her walk on her hands a thousand times. And, wh and wh what was there so wonderful about watching a boy? She flung herself upon him, and they fought like dogs. The coppers lost irre irrecoverably. Her sisters circled them, crying and wringing their hands. She had to win no matter how. He bent her head and butted him with, in, in the groin where the weakness of the boys was, the contradictory delectacy. The, the fight was knocked out of him. He laid very still, his hands shielding his innocent maleness from further assault and the blood on his lips where his anguished teeth had sunk in. His sisters fluttered around him. They had no pride for her, for her victory. Instead, they pitied him. They watched him with wonder. What was there to being a boy? What was there to being a man? Men just worked. It was easier than what women did. It was a woman who did the lying awake, the planning, the sorrowing, the scheming, the stretch a dollar. That was the hard part, the head part. The woman had to think all the time. The woman had to be smart. Her sisters weren't smart. They thought Paul was the head of the house. They didn't know the house was run, run by the beat of Mama's heart. There was an awful loneliness in Cleo when Mama went, went across the river to Grandma's. She did not she did not want to be bad then. She wanted to be good so God would send Mama back safe. But she was wildly bad again the moment Mama returned. She could not bear the way she felt inside, like laughing and crying and kissing Mama's face. 
She never kissed Mama. Kisses were silly. Pa kissed Mama when he came home from work. There was sweat on him from his labor, but Mama lifted his, her mouth to his. His mustache prickled against her lips, but Mama did not pull away. Looking at her sister standing above the suffering boy, he, she saw in each, in each some likeness of Mama and charity, the softness and roundness, the flush just under the thin skin, the silver laughter and lily, the doe eyes, liquid and vulnerable, the plated hair that kept escaping in curls, and small Serena, the cherry red mouth, the dimpled cheeks. She knew that she looked like Pa. Everyone said so. Everyone said she was a beauty. What was wrong with their singing? How could she look like Pa with his sweat and stained mustache, making every making making any make anybody a beauty? Sometimes she would stare at herself in Mama's mirror and stick out her tongue. Now seeing her sisters with their tender faces turned towards the boy, a terrible sorrow assailed her. Some day they would all grow up. They would all get married and go away. They would never live together again, nor share the long, bright days. The long, bright, busy days. Mama, too, would go. Mama would die. Didn't she always say that her side of the family were not long livers? They were dead before they were 50. Dead with their loveliness alive and their still smooth faces. When Mama was gone in her last luminous moment, there would be this look on her of her and that silver laughter in her children she had blessed with her resemblance. So as long as her sisters were, were within sight and sound, they were mirrors in which she could see Mama. They would be her remembering of her happy, happy childhood. She flung herself down on the ground. Her torture was worse than a boy's. For hers was a spiritual suffering and an immeasurable frustration. All of her all of her future, of the, uh, all of her terror of the future, all of her despair and knowing that nothing lasts, that sisters turn into wives, that men take their women and ride away, that childhood is no longer, is no longer than a summer day, wherein her great dry sobs, the boy staggered to his feet in c complete alarm. He thought he had hurt her in some dreadful way, some dreadful, mysterious way, the girls, her breasts, her belly, where babies grew. Her father would skin him alive. He, he made a limp, limping dash across the road and, and the trees closed in. Then her sisters kneeled beside her, letting their smoothing fingers caress her face. Her sobbing quieted. She jumped up and began turning cartwheels. The wildness was in her. She was going to turn cartwheels all the way home here at the four and impossible feet. Mama was in the draw doorway watching her hurtle down a dusty road, seeing a girl 11 years old turning upside down, showing her drawers. Mama got the strap again and laid her on hard and heavy. Cleo just grinned and wouldn't wipe the grin off, even with the whole of her on fire and hurting. Mama couldn't bear such imprudence from her own flesh and blood. She let the strap fall and sat down and cried. Mama didn't know what made Cleo so wild. Cleo got more of her attention than all of her other children put together. God helped her when she grew up. God helped the man who married her. God helps her sisters not to follow in her footsteps. Better for her sisters if Cleo had never been born. Somewhere in Springfield, Massachusetts at that moment, Bart Judson, a grown man, a businessman, too rest arrested, and a mighty Almighty Dollar to give any thought to a wife was certainly giving no thought to an 11-year-old hellraiser way down south. But for Bart, whose inescapable destiny this unknown hooligan was to be, it had been, it might have been better if her, if her sisters had never been born. Chapter 3 Cleo arrived in Springfield three years later. She and Josie reached their teens within a month of each other. Cleo became the Kennedy kitchen help and caught her, caught her hair up in a bright bandana to keep it out of the cooking. Josie caught, up, caught her hair up too, but with pins and combs in the, in, in the fashion. She put on a long dress and dream and learned to pour tea in the parlor. Cleo learned to call her Miss Josephine and never said anything that was harder. Providence appeared as an elderly spinster, a northern lady seeking sun for a sci sciatica. Cleo's way home laid past her boarding place. She was entranced by Cleo's beauty.
as she returned from work, her hair flying free, the color still standing her cheeks from the heat of the cook stove and the fire in her heart, and her eyes see green from her sullen anger and working in the white folks' kitchen. Miss Peterson, hating to see this sultry loveliness ripen in the amoral atmosphere of the South, urged Mama to take Cleo North. Mama considered it an answer to her prayers. With Cleo getting so grown, Mama's heart stayed in her mouth. She didn't know what many Cleo might disgrace herself. The wildness in that child might turn to wantonness in the, in, in the girl, and that would kill Pa. Better for him if she sent Cleo north with this, with this strict-looking spinster. Cleo considered going north an adventure. Miss Josephine, who had never been outside of Carolina, would turn green with envy. In her secret sessions with her heart-sick sisters, Cleo promised to send for them as soon as she got rich, and she did not, did not know she was going to do it, but this boastful promise was more important than the performance. She thought she was going to night school when she reached the North, but her conscientious custodian, seeing that Cleo looked just as vividly alive in Springfield as she looked in South Carolina, decided against permitting her to walk down darkened streets alone. There were too many temptations along the way in the guise of coachmen and butlers and portlers. Cleo's time between her easy chores was spent in training her tongue to a northern twist and learning to laugh with a minimum show of teeth and to memorizing a new word in a dictionary every day. The things that Cleo never had to be taught were how to hold her head high, how to score and sin with men, and how to keep her left hand from knowing what her right hand was doing. She saw Bart Judson six months after her arrival on one of the few occasions she was left she was let out of her cloister. This brief encounter with a plate glass window between them made no impression on either participant. The wheels of their inseparable destiny were revolving slowly, for shortly thereafter Bart was to be on his way to Boston, and not for five more years was Cleo to follow, and then with no knowledge that Bart Justin had preceded her. They stared disinterestedly at each other. He's seeing only a pretty half-grown countrified girl. She's seeing only a sheriff's lead man with a mustache, and neither recognizing fate, the disappointed goddess had left had a half a mind to change their, their charted course, then with habitual perversity thought better of it. Cleo had come to a halt before a storefront where an exquisite pile of polished fruit were arrayed on a silver tray, the sole and eye-compelling window display. Two men were busy inside this store, one a fair-skinned man whom Cleo mistook for white and the proprietor was waiting on the customer, the other man. Obviously, the colored help was restocking the counter. The colored man stared briefly as did Cleo, then her eyes moved to a wide arch which made, made convenient access to an ice cream parlor next door. Two retail stores on busy State Street was the distance Virginia-born Bart had come in his lucky boots on his way to the banana docks of the Boston market. Cleo with ten cents burning in her pocket and her throat parched for a fancy dish of ice cream, slowly walked away because she wasn't certain that the owner wanted colored customers, and as a matter of fact, Bart didn't. When he and Cleo met five years later, again it was pure chance, but this time fate flung them headlong at each other, and Bart, for at least there was no mistaking that he had met the woman he wanted for his wife. Cleo was sent to Boston by the relatives of her Springfield bene benefactress when the old lady's lingering illness had inevitably leading, led her to the grave. The relatives rallied around her, for there were always cases of elderly people deciding to leave their estate for faithful servants. They arrived on Mars. For there were cases, too, of elderly people deciding that one devoted relative was more deserving than the rest. They overflowed the small house. There was no room for Cleo, and there was no need for the woman industry cooked and cleaned and went errands and wrote letters. One of the letters was to a Boston friend of Miss Peterson, who knew Cleo slightly from her occasional visits to Springfield. When she and Porn to give shelter to this young Negro girl, with Christian charity, she promptly did so. 
She shared her home with a nephew whom she had raised and educated. The young man coming of age was not grateful. He wanted to get married. He intended to leave home. He was so adulterant about these matters that his aunt, Miss Bourne, was nearly resigned to spending her declining years alone, regretting the sacrifice he had caused the spinsterhood. Have a great day.